so we should probably get started because we're three minutes after now, and I'm sure more people will trickle in as we go, but um, I um, get the pleasure of introducing Sarah today because Brenda, the chair of our peer committee, is um, overseas at the moment and unable to join us. Um, so I think hopefully many of you remember Sarah, we're proud to call her one of our own. Um, she is now an assistant professor um, in the Department of Anthropology at Idaho State University. Um, but she um, did her MA and her PhD here at the University of Maine in the Anthropology of Environmental Policy program. Um, but she was also a participant in that first IGER on adaptation to abrupt climate change um, and did some really great interdisciplinary work through that program um, that led into her dissertation, which was funded by the NSF, a really cool dissertation that looked at adaptation to um, abrupt climate change in fisheries um, in the context of um, a climate influenced um, algal bloom. And I know Kirk was a big collaborator there, so that was fun. Um, and in the context of um, also significant advances in aquaculture in the region during that time. So um, she had an NSF rapid, which was pretty cool. Um, so more generally, uh, on a broader sense, Sarah's work um, looks at the intersection between governance, adaptation, and social change in marine socioecological systems that are undergoing rapid environmental and climatic change. Um, her work focuses on understanding opportunities for the transformation of governance and adaptation in these rapidly changing oceanscapes, specifically in southern Chile. Um, she also, um, just to update some of you, is, is part of a cool um, EPSCOR program at Idaho State uh, called Genes to the Environment, Modeling Mechanisms and Mapping. So I don't know if we'll hear some about that today, Sarah, but that sounds cool too. And finally, for those of you who didn't um, hear, as we were just discussing uh, a few minutes ago, Sarah is the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship coming up uh, in this next year to go back to Chile and, and do additional research. So Sarah, we're thrilled to have you back and looking forward to hearing some more about what you've been up to. Well, thanks, Cindy. I'm not going to talk too much about F-score today, but I can okay. after if we have time. Sure. Um, I also told Cindy I have recovering from strep throat, so I apologize if I sound odd <laughs> at all. Um, so, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, let me give you, I'm not sure. Uh, Becky, can you give Sarah um, a co-host? I, I think I can. Oh, can you? Okay. Is okay. You see my Never screen? Mind. All right. Okay, everyone see that? Yep. You look all good. right. Awesome. Okay, so I know most of you, but again, my name is Sarah Ebel. Um, so thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to have the opportunity to collaborate with CCI. Um, we don't have a huge focus on climate change at Idaho State um, or any institute similar to CCI in the state of Idaho, um, except kind of our at University of Idaho with some resilience focus. But um, because my work is really embedded in the impacts of climate change and uh, looking at adaptation, I thought it might be beneficial to both myself and some work that I'm doing, as well as if I can serve CCI um, to be doing work with you folks. And so I'm just gonna talk about environmental governance today. This is a very general um, title, uh, just because I created it quickly when we were doing this, um, but thinking about environmental governance and what is equitable environmental governance? What does that mean in the context of um, not just climate change, but also socioeconomic change and around the world? Oops, hold on. Okay, so we can think of climate change as a threat multiplier, and this is a really important thread of discussions about adaptation to climate change and governance, because uh, the impacts of climate change are amplified and or uh, really kind of um, really affect the outcomes of what those impacts are based on many different pre-existing problems like histories of oppression and marginalization of groups, um, lack of infrastructure, for example, and all of these things come together to amplify the effects of climate change um, differentially across the world. And so when we think about climate change, we need to think about climate change within the broader context of global change. And so I'm going to use the word global change more probably than climate change within this talk, um, but that is meant to incorporate these kind of global the effects of globalization and economic change in regions around the world. And so <clears throat> I tend to focus in marine socioecological systems. And we see along the coastal zone in particular, this tension developed between traditional ways of life and rural livelihoods and what we consider modernity. And so the kind of impact of what economic change looks like and globalization looks like at the local scale. Um, and these rural livelihoods are really contending with the impacts of large industry um, and new ocean uses. Um, and 
both are impacted by climate change. And so there's this separate kind of contention and issue going on between rural livelihoods and large industry. And then those are both uh, amplified by these impacts of climate change. And so these pictures actually come from a friend of mine who works on a large industrial aquaculture farm in Chile. Um, she sent me some pictures recently, uh, what, what that looks like. And so I work in the lakes region of Chile. This is in the southern, southern Chile, as you see here, it's about, I don't know, 15 hours south of Santiago driving. And this tension between rural livelihoods and um, industry has been really brewing since the early 2000s with the introduction of large scale fish farms. Um, climate change is worsening the effects of marine pollution from these fish farms as warming sea surface temperatures combine with eutrophication to pr uh, produce large scale harmful algal blooms. Um, so just briefly in this region, there's over 30,000 small scale harvesters and that ranges from benthic divers, seaweed harvesters and fishers. So we can, fishers are people who actually fish on boats for fish. <laughs> um, this is the most fishery dependent region in Chile and it's one of the most impoverished. There are also over 60,000 individuals in this region employed by large scale industrial aquaculture. And so this kind of, if we can think about it as an ecosystem of actors, we have rural livelihoods and people dependent upon wild harvesting and the same families, the young people and those same families are dependent upon large scale industrial aquaculture for their, for their income. Um, and so it's not a cut and dry case of large industry is bad and rural livelihoods are good or vice versa. Um, it's very mixed, um, which is driving some of the issues in this region. And so in 2016, some of you have seen me talk before, but there was a massive red tide that killed millions of marine species in this region um, and initiated a moratorium on the export of salmon aquaculture product. Um, this event had really serious social and economic impacts for the re region, ranging from food insecurity in rural areas to the closure of tens of thousands of aquaculture jobs, um, essentially shutting down the economy. And so what's important about this problem is that it's not considered unique. It's not considered a one-time event. Um, it's instead predicted to happen with more and more frequency. And so we see on the left a picture, this is from National Geographic in 2016, um, a picture of the one picture of much of the death of marine species. Um, and I was in Chile actually just after this event and it was really devastating to see how people had to manage with this. And so many people were focused on subsistence agriculture to try to have food security. And they were also giving food away um, to their neighbors and friends. Uh, we also saw a lot of youth out migrate from their communities to urban centers in order to send money home, um, working in, outside of marine resource harvesting. This is a picture a friend of mine sent me. This was just last year in 2022 with another toxic algal bloom, um, not at the same scale as the 2016 one, but this is a diver uh, surrounded by dead salmon. Uh, and so these are divers that are working on salmon aquaculture farms. So it's not just rural livelihoods that are impacted, it's also these folks who are working on these farms, having to clean up fish. It's an extremely dangerous job. That's a discussion for another time, but um, we see the span of time, six years, and these, these events are happening with more and more frequency, if not at the same scale, um, but across the region. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned, the region's experiencing warming sea surface temperatures and higher levels of marine pollution. Um, and so to better understand these changes over time, I've been working with Kirk Mosh, thanks Kirk. <laughs> and we have some ongoing work mapping uh, these environmental changes um, using sea surface temperature and chlorophyll data. And so I don't really have to explain these maps to you guys, but these maps are zoomed into the two communities where I've been working, Carl Mapu, which is on the mainland of, of Chile and Ancud, which is the urban center of a really rural island of Chiloé. Um, if you see this pink, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the pink is our designated areas where divers harvest. Um, that's specifically for divers. And so we were interested when Kirk and I were making these maps. Well, Kirk made the maps, but Kirk and I were, were collaborating to look at this change more broadly. We were interested in how, how did this problem occur? What did it look like before the red tide? What does it look like in the past? And so we were interested in looking at sea surface temperature anomalies and where we wanna pay attention to Sorry, I'm looking this way because this is my bigger screen. Um, but where we want to pay attention to is this lower left-hand map where we see really strong sea surface temperature anomalies in 2016, in January 2016, which is chilly summer. Um, and we also see in the bottom right-hand map 
um, really high levels of chlorophyll concentration. And so these two things came together and triggered this red tide. There's a really extensive report, it's all in Spanish, but um, by oceanographers and climate scientists about this event. Um, and so reading through that also helped explain this event. And I think working with Kirk and reading that other report has really helped me understand what do these changes look like over time? And um, we are hoping to continue this. And what, what's really interesting about this is we can see potentially different, like spatial impacts, differential impacts of climate change um, and marine pollution based on where people fish. And what I'd like to do with this is actually increase it or not increase it, but not just focus on divers, but also look at informal harvesters, like seaweed harvesters and see how that impacted them. Cause that's mostly women, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, um, but are largely left out of governance. And so we can start to see these changes um, across time using maps and working across our disciplines um, to kind of make a plan moving forward. And so <clears throat> despite economic precarity in this region, um, we know as anthropologists, as Anita <laughs> the manifestation of globalization and climate change at the local and regional scale can really catalyze the emergence of new cultural forms, such as institutions and other local actions. And so it doesn't only create devastation, we can create positive things that come from this as well. Um, and so I just recently assigned my students this paper, I'm teaching a climate change adaptation this semester um, by Orlov et al. 2019. And it's about how groups frame climate change in frontline communities. And I just really liked this quote because um, it gives some hope, I think, to what may seem like a devastating situation. But or how do we move from spheres of perception and explanation, which means how do we move from just you know, studying communities' perceptions of change and how it affects them to the realm of action? How do we start creating action? How do communities create their own actions at the local and regional scales? Um, and this really brings me to my overarching research question that drives my research and some of the applied work that I'm doing, but it's how can we create just and equitable governance transitions in the face of global change? Um, so governance is the arrangement of institutions that really underpin hopefully a shared collective effort of stakeholders to make decisions and choose goals and work to achieve those goals together. That's much easier said than done. Um, and while I'm focused on marine socioecological systems today, this question has relevance across all environmental systems, uh, both ecological and social systems that are impacted by climate change and many you know, various histories of interaction and use of the environment. And so we can, and I do take this question and use it in Idaho. We can use it in forest, forest systems, water systems, really anywhere around the world. We can ask the same question. Um, and so one form of action that communities and uh, other stakeholders can take is to ad adapt their existing governance structure to the current and predicted impacts of global change. And one of the really big uh, gaps in research has been that we didn't really understand what factors contribute to or inhibit transitions in governance, specifically equitable governance. You can transition governance, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be equitable. Often governance transitions can reproduce inequities and in the marginalization of groups. Um, and so how do we transition governance for adaptation without reproducing inequities uh, moving forward? And that's a really big question in the climate change literature, as well as just more broadly environmental governance. So uh, we've been using mixed, when I say we, I have two graduate students, one who's graduated and one who's graduating soon actually. Um, and we've used mixed methods in this region. I've been working, doing research in this region since 2016 and have been living on and off in this region since 2012, 2010. Um, but my two graduate students and I have spent a cumulative 20 months um, in this region, conducting well over hundred semi-structured interviews many, many, many hours of participant observation. And we've been really looking at, you know, what new institutions emerged after the red tide? How did people act collectively to, to form at new institutions? Um, who led those efforts? And what factors contributed to their emergence or transition? And then who was left out of these transitions and why were they left out? And um, that's a really big question that's my research is focusing more on now. And so I'm just gonna briefly discuss this one question of what factors contribute to or inhibit transition of cur current governance structures um, in socioecological systems. And then I'm gonna move towards what I'm working on now with the Fulbright actually and, and some new research, um, but just generally, so this comes from many different papers. This isn't just one paper. Um, Chile has a multi-level governance structure that governs ocean use and coastal use in 
the entirety of the country. Um, there, in governance, we know that nested institutions and multi-level structures tend to be more adaptive than, you know, just just top-down structures or just bottom-up. Um, and so this is what their structure looks like right now. Um, so we can see that there are horizontal and vertical linkages between all these different institutions. I'm not gonna break down these institutions for today, but the big piece is we don't see any horizontal uh, structures between these three groups here. If you can see my cursor, fishing unions, private aquaculture companies, and indigenous communities. Yet these are the three groups that are really impacted by climate change impacts as well as economic change in the region. And so I was interested in, you know, how are how are they going to take this multi-level governance structure and, and change it to be more adaptive uh, within the context of these large harmful algal blooms? Um, because it was very evident in 2016 that that not having collaboration between these groups has an effect on the outcome of equitable transitions. <clears throat> And so over many, many, many months of research, this is very simplified, but um, we found that certain groups are creating a new institution called a management committee. And these groups that are creating this are more formal groups, except for independent fishers. So they're fishing unions, seafood processors, the government, indigenous communities, which actually is a formalized group in Chile, um, and independent fishers. And they're coming together to form management committees. Um, that will allow them to actually create larger, more inclusive management areas. And they're doing this to protect themselves from the effects of aquaculture. So aquaculture is expanding in Chile. Um, it, it just continues to expand. There are these threats of having really large um, kind of offshore, which they're developing aquaculture uh, farms that can go into the areas where these folks fish um, or affect the areas where these folks fish and harvest. And so these groups are coming together to form a management committee. This is a form of collective action within this context, but what actually is initiating it is a top-down policy that was created in 2012 as an amendment to one of their fisheries laws that said that you're able to create these management committees, but then it puts responsibility on those resource users to do that. Um, what we found, which is interesting, is that there are some communities that are able to transition to this type of management committee where other ones are not transitioning. Um, even though this management committee allows them many different types of protections from large scale aquaculture, and it also diversifies their use of the marine ecosystem. So instead of just diving for benthic resources, the areas that they are um, creating allow for small shellfish aquaculture, um, marine protected areas, harvesting. Sorry, I have my window open. Speaking of climate change, our building's so old that it's so hot in here, it's terrible. <laughs> it's very bad. Um, so, we're seeing these different transitions happening or not happening even within this small region. And so what we've been looking at is really trying to understand, well, what factors are contributing to transitions and what factors are inhibiting those transitions? Um, and we found that linking social capital, which are the hierarchical relationships you have, social relationships you have. So for example, linking social capital is like me as a PhD student, and then I am linked to Cindy Eisenhower, who is an authority figure above me. And that would allow me to have some type of, you know, social or cultural or some type of context that helps me do something or get a connection. And so linking social capital within this context is really thinking about or looking at social relationships between resource users, harvesters, and what connections they have with government officials or universities. And we see that some communities have very strong relationships with government officials and universities. And those are those communities are actually transitioning their governance to have this management committee and overall, they have this kind of stronger leadership and, and overarching view. Um, they have these collective preferences and visions for the future. Um, we also found, and maybe some of you are familiar with Tim Waring's work at UMaine, um, but that there's a culture of cooperation in one of the communities that we're working in, which is on the island of Chiloé. And if you look historically at Chiloé, um, there's been cooperation in many different forms that we see. I don't know if anyone's familiar with these things, but called La Minga, which is like reciprocal labor source, you know, relationships that have existed there for a long time. Um, the literature on the culture of cooperation or evolution of cooperation is what Tim Waring studies, but um, 
supports these ideas that when people live in really harsh climates or when they have these certain, you know, co through colonization, these certain things that are happening to them might produce cooperation and that produce that cooperation can evolve over time. And so it seems that in the community of Anku, the urban center on Chiloé, we're seeing aspects of this culture of cooperation where there are just higher levels of cooperation and they're used to working together. They're used to working across groups. Um, whereas in another community that I've we're working in the community of Karl Mapu on the mainland, there is no cooperation. There's cooperation be within groups, like such as an indigenous community and non-indigenous fishers, but there's not cooperation across those groups. And if we think about cooperation over time or the evolution of cooperation, it could be that Karl Mapu was actually settled pretty recently because they were in some ways forced to settle with um, colonization and then the effects of policy um, in the 80s and 90s. And so, the other thing we found was that when people were not cooperating, it was largely attributed to how people legitimize their belonging to the environment or to the space. And so indigenous people legitimize their belonging um, through, you know, since time immemorial in those re in those areas and how they've used those resources. And non-indigenous fishers really legitimize their belonging through policy and the creation of management areas and things like that, which is really since the early 1990s. Um, this creates divergent visions for the future. And it seems to create this fear of losing power. And so one group might fear that they're gonna lose power in adaptation or the creation of something, a plan moving forward, and that makes them not cooperate. And so we're trying to understand why, you know, why would one community, right, transition to um, new governance where another one wouldn't. And these are some of the things that we found. Um, <clears throat> it goes a lot deeper into the culture of those communities and how they were settled. But um, it's interesting because in adaptation literature, previously we we see, or we assumed that people within even a community of 2,500 people would just make a plan to adapt and move forward. But what we're actually finding is that there are divergent ideas for adaptation um, and that affects how people are going to respond to the impacts of climate change. So what's, interesting about doing research for a while now, which I'm, not, I'm sure all of you have experienced, is that you start to see things when you're in a region for a while that um, you didn't really expect or you didn't really think about before you went there after many years. <laughs> and so I've noticed that women just were not formally involved in any of these governance transitions. Uh, women were really le largely left out of conversations. Uh, I've mostly interviewed men because um, those are the divers and those are the people who are in charge of fishing unions. And, but I would see women, I would see women as seafood processors, I'd see women seaweed harvesting, I you know know women and I'd talk to them and what they were doing. And um, I was like, what, what's happened? What is, how are women affected by these, you know, the impacts of climate change and global change at these scales? And what are they doing perhaps informally to help their communities? <laughs> and so one of my students who's on the right here in the green jacket, her name's Jillian, um, she took this idea and ran with it, which is awesome. And so she's been, she's defending in April, but she's uh, been looking at visible and invisible labor of women in these communities. She's been particularly looking at well being, but uh, we're working on a paper together about how women labor to decrease community well being or to decrease community vulnerability and increase community well being. Um, so this paper's just in prep, but we're looking at visible labor. And so women are indigenous community leaders, they're creating marine protected areas. Uh, women are divers and aquaculture companies as well. And while one might think that might not increase the <clears throat> resilience of their communities, it allows them other occupational opportunities and money to not be connected to men and to bring that money home to their communities. <clears throat> and then we see more women going to universities if they're able um, to study aquaculture. And I've interviewed several young women with Jillian that are really interested in creating small scale aquaculture farms in their communities so that they can harvest year round um, shellfish and seaweed. And that would be actually easier on their bodies because see seaweed harvesting is extremely difficult. Um, but we also see invisible labor and that's largely less tangible unless you're spending a lot of time with them. And so Jillian spent significant time with women over the past two years in, in this region of Chile. And I was with her in November and December down there. And we, and she's documented a lot of community food sharing, which decreases vulnerability in communities. And that might not be a direct form of adaptation to climate change, but it is helping people um, <clears throat> really 
kind of sustain themselves when there are changes that, or, you know, their health or anything environmental or otherwise changes in their communities. Um, women are raising money for community members. So they're either selling food, they're holding fair to us, which are markets, um, like very informal markets. Um, and then we know of one woman, young woman who's buying gear, fishing gear, which is it's really interesting. Um, fishing gear in bulk and she sell it, she sells it at low cost. So she buys it in the urban center and then she brings it to the communities and sells it at low cost to community members um, so that it helps them get the gear for cheap. And then she makes a little money as well, which helps her family. <clears throat> um, and so these invisible, invisible labor that women do has brought me to what is my Fulbright question. Um, and it's how do women enact what we call comedy? And I'm not going to unpack this today, but um, commenting to reclaim the physical marine commons, but also their culture from global industry. And so, you know, how are women participating informally or formally in the transition and governance? And that's very, maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but based on my reading, it's women have been documented to be participators of seaweed, you know, seafood harvesters and seafood processors around the world in informal ways. But there isn't much literature on how women transition governance informally, especially when they're um, not formally allowed to be in institutions such as like fishing unions um, or these management committees. And so <clears throat> I'm working with the folks at La Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia, Chile to work on this question with an economic anthropologist. And uh, this is questions part of a much larger project of theirs. This question's mine, but um, I couched under a much larger project of theirs, which is looking at global change, the effects of global change in Patagonia and the Southern cone of Chile. And um, again, that's ranging from looking at kelp, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, to uh, ec economies and markets, uh, which is what the economic anthropologist does. And we're going to include women's informal and sometimes formal contributions to that. So, all right. <clears throat> so based on, I guess, six years now of formal research in Chile and, um, oh my gosh, like 13 years of being there on and off and, and gaining relationships and with folks there, um, I've, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> I didn't write this part out, but I've been thinking about how does one take local action? How do, you know, what is the responsibility of an anthropologist or a researcher in general in the communities in which they work? Um, to do something for those communities, if that's the role. And I just had this discussion with my students. What is the role of an anthropologist? Is the role just to study communities and bring back information and publish on it? Is the role to be an advocate? Is the role to be an activist? That's a very personal question uh, for a researcher, but we all have our own biases as to why we do, do our research, whether we're an anthropologist or a climate scientist. And so um, my bias is, <laughs> Is working with communities. I want to support the communities that I work with. They've been, you know, opening their homes to me for a long time. Um, and so I co-founded an organization with an indigenous community leader and a diver, a female diver, and it's called La Fuerza del Buso, which means the strength of a diver. But we're actually in the midst of changing this name to be more representative of genders that, like all genders that work within the ocean space. And so we'll probably be called Las Manos del Mar, which is the, the hands of the sea to represent everyone who's working within this context along the ocean. Um, I'll talk about that idea in a second, but yeah, we're trying to, we're a community-based organization. And so we founded this organization and we're this very small nonprofit. We're a 501c3 in the United States and we are almost the equivalent. It's been a very long process, bureaucratic process in Chile, but we're almost the equivalent in Chile. And we're focused on marine conservation, public health initiatives with a focus on occupational health um, and community development along Chile's coast. And so I decided that I have the energy, sometimes <laughs> with my 16 month old daughter, not always, but the energy and the resources to uh, work with these folks, to apply for funds and develop programs with them. And so our overall mission is to foster sustainable ecosystems and resilient communities. And we use that this three-pronged approach where we're looking at marine conservation occupational health and community development. Um, we work across a, what one considers a constellation of actors. Um, and so while we are a group that brings together rural resource harvesters, um, we also work with universities. And I'm in the midst of developing a 
uh, what's it called? A public private partnership with a very large aquaculture company. And that's been a very interesting process that I've talked to Kirk about actually, because it's been very surprising. So um, the folks you see here, this is Astrid. She is a, a new professor at La Universidad de Aysen in Coaique, Chile, which is farther south of here. And she's a medical researcher. And so she is leading the way in understanding uh, occupational health of divers and the issues um, associated with their occupation. And so I'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> Juanita, she's been doing like for 30 years informal diving accident prevention programs in the region that she works with a doctor and she just does it on her own time. She's a retired paramedic. Um, this is Jose. He's an indigenous community leader and he helped, helped me found this organization. Um, and we're working with La Universidad Austral, which is the university in Chile. And then we're working with Salmon Chile now. And so Salmon Chile is a large aquaculture company. It sounds counterintuitive to work with a large aquaculture company that's having, you know, contributing to these devastating impacts in this region. Um, but <clears throat> the reality of the situation is that they are not going away and they are kind of being, not kind of, they're being pressured to clean up some of their, not just this company, but clean up their acts and um, the government's regulating them more. Um, and so what's interesting about Sam and Chile is I reached out to the, to a connection I had who connected me to the territorial director of this organization or this organization, I say organization, it's a corporation, corporation. Um, and I met with him over Zoom and this group is, it has their own sector of community programs. So they work directly with communities to bring in whatever the communities want. And that ranges from they have programs in, um, oh, sorry, it's just thinking in Spanish, but the, what's it called? Language revitalization for indigenous groups in this region to, you know, bringing in and training rural communities to do shellfish aquaculture at the small scale. And so they have these things that give back. Obviously, one of the reasons why they're giving back is because they're a large corporation and they have to. Um, but also the man that I was speaking with really is passionate about this. And so um, I don't think it's enough to just work on our own as a nonprofit organization. I think that it's better if we work as, as across all these groups, um, and especially because Sam and Chile has way more money than we do. <laughs> but they're also really interesting as an organization. And so what we do with this group is we use multi-stakeholder dialogue um, and a community-based approach. And so multi-stakeholder dialogue is really an attempt to achieve equity and accountability and communication between stakeholders. Um, so again, if we look across this group, there's different needs and different ideas and um, different reasons and objectives for doing things. But the overarching objective of each one of these people or each one of these groups is to have some type of sustainable socio-ecological system. Oops, yeah, okay. So um, so we're facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue through, through focus groups and meetings across these different groups. Um, and then we're also using this community-based approach, which is a philosophical approach that uh, suggests that or actively has communities play a role and participate in highlighting and addressing issues that matter to them. One of the problems with climate adaptation as well as um, international development is that uh, communities often are not involved in the discussion of where their communities are going to go and what kind of programs they want. Um, there are many reasons for that. I think one of the reasons too is because it takes a long time. Um, to actually co-produce knowledge with stakeholders, to jointly form goals and you know, foster outcomes and programs within this context takes a really long time. Um, it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of meetings. Um, and so we're doing that and trying to take the slow approach to a long-term goal of community and ecosystem sustainability. And so we have a couple different projects that we are working on. And one of them is WIRO, the restoration of WIRO or giant kelp. And so probably many of you are familiar, but giant kelp are um, an essential habitat for many species, particularly in the Southern Cone, but you find giant kelp in many different regions of the world. Um, they're also key players in carbon sequestration to mitigate climate change. And so we often think about mitigation of climate change, actually just came out today, you guys probably saw it, the UN is saying that we need to act globally <laughs> to mitigate climate change. Um, but we can also sometimes act locally to mitigate climate change as well. And one of those ways is by conserving some, something like giant kelp. Um, and so a couple divers in this region contacted me and said that they 
really wanted to have some type of protections for the species and, and some type of program to support that. Um, <clears throat> giant kelp, again, is a carbon sequester, but it's also very economically important for rural livelihoods in this region. It's not a main source of income, but it's a supplemental source of income where they harvest it. Um, and so giant kelp has been over-exploited for many different reasons, not just by rural uh, small-scale harvesters, but also large-scale harvesters. Um, and in 2019, Chile, the Senate passed legislation to protect this species. And there's a lot of foundations pushing, global foundations pushing for you know, a moratorium on no harvest, like you can't harvest any of the species. But that can have devastating effects for rural livelihoods. And so we are starting to work with local people and other researchers. And this is why, I'm, if anyone's interested in this, going more broadly to connect more universities to, and researchers to this problem. But how do we develop a pilot program to do this kind of research? And so this is a zoomed in picture. Sorry, it's kind of blurry. Uh, this is a picture I took in December. But when they harvest giant kelp right now, see this part in the left where I'm circling? They're taking the whole plant. So they're taking the, um, right, you say it's the, um, I can't remember the English word, the thing, the roots, sorry, the roots that get stuck to, that are stuck to the rock. They're taking that whole plant largely because it weighs more. It weighs more and they get better pay for it. Um, and these are people who make, you know, upwards of $200 a month in an economy and with inflation that they cannot live on $200 a month. And so it makes sense that they're harvesting in this way. Um, but people are concerned. There are harvesters that are concerned about this. And so um, we're looking at what we can do to support some type of pilot program that changes the way individuals harvest. And so one of our objectives is to restore giant kelp and support rural livelihoods. So how can we do both? Um, and we're interested in starting to do, I had a student, my student Jessica started to do this, of local ecological knowledge and mapping. Where are these? Where do they harvest? Where are these kelp forests? Um, and then taking this idea of where these kelp forests are and how they harvest and starting a community-led program or kind of research project of how can we do this better? How can we, you know, I don't, I, I don't study kelp, so I actually don't know. Is it better to take the whole plant in one area and leave another area? Is it better to cut kind of like you would, might wanna cut your lettuce so that it grows back? Um, I don't know the answer to that, um, but we're looking for people who do and who, people who also can measure carbon sequestration, like how much carbon does kelp sequester and what is the best way to make sure that carbon is sequestered, or excuse me, the kelp is sequestering carbon while resource users can also harvest the species. And so this is kind of an open-ended question right now, um, but this is our idea of of how we do spatiotemporal harvesting efforts. Do we do rotational closures? There's all these questions um, and we need collaborations to be able to do this kind of project. But I think that it has, uh, it, it can pro uh, provide a framework that can be used elsewhere in the world where there are these large kelp forests. Um, <clears throat> there's also discussion with our organization about collaborating with folks who can train these individuals to grow kelp instead of harvesting wild kelp. Um, and you guys are in Maine, there's a lot of kelp growing happening there now as an effort um, for carbon sequestration as well as food. And so, you know, how can we collaboratively design and propose these protections? So here's just a couple more pictures of them. They harvest a lot of kelp. Um, and then the other project that we're working on, or one of the other ones that intersects with climate change is occupational health. And that sounds kind of odd, like how does occupational health intersect with climate change? Um, and I didn't know this until recently, <clears throat> but uh, it intersects with climate change because anecdotally at least, diving accidents are increasing in this region and people are attributing that to this change of distribution and abundance of benthic resources that they're harvesting. And so a lot, almost, this is from a paper, but 80% of divers in Chile have experienced the bends, which is the decompression sickness <clears throat> or illness, at least once in their lifetimes. And many of them experience it way more frequently than just once. The, the issue with decompression illness is that you don't always know if you have it. Um, and so you might have, you might have been down, I don't know if people are familiar with diving, but you might be down too long or come up too fast and just be dizzy or confused. And you attribute that to something else. Um, but that's actually the bends and the bends is cumulative. And so over time, when you keep having these experiences, you keep uh, basically 
you're going to have more and more problems with your body. And so I've seen individuals who explain this, these incidences by saying that the pressure underneath, you know, they dive like 40 meters or deeper, that the pressure underwater is actually compressing their bones, but that's not, I didn't know, but until recently, but that's not actually accurate. It's that nitrogen is coming out in their blood and it's just deteriorating their joints. And so they're, they actually appear shrunken. Um, <clears throat> so with climate change, um, at least anecdotally, and uh, as benthic resources move deeper or they move farther offshore and these divers have to go deeper and they have to stay down longer, it's potentially increasing, or that's what they're saying. And so is the women at La Universidad uh, de Asen, Asen, but is increasing the effects of diving accidents. And so we're working with Astrid, who's at that university in Juanita, who is the woman who's been doing the uh, these kind of accident prevention workshops for past 30 years, and we're trying to formalize them. And we're applying to uh, the U.S. National Institute of Occupational uh, Safety and Health to support this research on interventions. So how do we create interventions? How do we measure the pre and post and have the intervention? Um, and how do we replicate that intervention globally? Because around the world, uh, through Latin America, South America, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, Oceania, every, everywhere there are divers and they are experiencing the bends. There was an article that came out a couple of years ago, but in the New York Times about this problem in Nicaragua. And so it's a, it's a global problem. And um, we're trying to focus on how do we create something that is applic you know, applicable and replicable elsewhere. But what we're looking for as well is to create collaborations with folks who have the skill sets to understand how is climate change impacting benthic resources? Where are those benthic resources going? Can we map them? And then can we actually create an intervention that is not just general, but also based on these kind of impacts that these folks are seeing at the local scale. And then how do we generalize them out to other places? So that's it. I'm a little early. <laughs> Watch fast. Um, yeah, and then just questions. And so this work, I didn't put the slide in, but it's been funded by National Science Foundation, Wenergren, uh, Idaho State, Fulbright, you know, all this a bunch of different groups so <clears throat> sam and chili hopefully soon <laughs> thanks so much sarah uh, everybody please join me in thanking sarah for a really great presentation thanks sarah okay i don't think that i'm supposed to facilitate questions i think we can just unmute and ask a question if you're interested hey sarah uh, I'm okay. curious to know about your interaction between men and women there as a female anthropologist. Did you receive different kinds of reactions from men versus women? That's a good question. Um, I was mostly focused on with unknowingly kind of on men um, initially. And so I would say my experience in Chile is always has always been very positive. People are very open and kind, whether they're men or women. Um, men are they're, they're very focused on their diving areas, the territorial use rights, which I didn't talk about today, fisheries, but, um, and then women, because they're less formally involved in management, they're somewhat harder to find. Um, but we, my student Jillian and I found women to talk to through my closest friends who I've just known for a really long time, who are divers on aquaculture farms. And then they, start, she, they started connecting us to women. And then we get connected to women around, you know, from there. And I found women to be extremely open. Like those are the they're the people who invite you into their homes and take you out to <laughs> harvest seaweed and you'll spend all day. Like I, what I've noticed, I've been doing less formalized semi-structured interviewing recently and I'll just contact someone and I will, cause I know that it's gonna be an all day affair. Like I can't schedule interviews, <laughs> especially with women. Um, and women tend to talk about their families more and why they're doing that. And what Jillian's actually found in her research is uh, women doing this invisible labor and kind of actually going behind their husband's backs to to make money and to have more um, kind of more what's the word I'm for economic st stability um, and they don't tell their husbands because they're because of machismo culture and so Jillian's actually seen a lot of that too um, Jillian's experience so because of COVID Chile closed their borders from March of 2020 till October, 2021. In October, 2021, I was very pregnant, like just like a few weeks outside of having Faye. <laughs> and so I couldn't go, but my students did. So Jillian went and Jessica did. 
in Jillian's experience, she was there for like, I don't know, a very long time because um, she could do all of her stuff remotely because of COVID. Um, and so she has found women to be very open. Um, and so I would say it's the difference is that women are very open and focused on their families, whereas men focus more on that management structure. And that could be biased in my asking them questions. So I'm not sure. But it's fun to study women because they're just, they're just fun. I don't know. <laughs> not that men aren't fun, <laughs> but within this context. <laughs> Yeah, I can go next because I I want to build off of Greg's question a little bit. I think this question of women's informal and like hidden work is um, is really interesting, and I I think especially like given the history and economic anthropology of studying um, you know forms of reproductive labor that we don't compensate and you know what that means. Um, so I'll, I I want to send you. I mean I think you're familiar with a lot of it, but I'll send you a couple of articles that I think are like foundational in that space. Um, but I did, so anyway, that's kind of a comment. And then I wanted to ask you, and I feel like I've asked this question before, but I forget what you said, so apologies. But in thinking about those management groups and like the different mm -hmm. communities that compose them, are all of those communities like mutually exclusive? I mean, they're kind of presented that way in your graphic, but like, are, are there no indigenous people that are involved in the aquaculture uh, or the um, labor organizations? Um, so just wondering about that, like to what extent they overlap? <clears throat> they overlap a lot. So when they, the reason why they look mutually excuse, exclusive in that graph uh, or that figure is because they um, identify with one more than the other, but most indigenous, so most of that region actually, whether they identify or not is indigenous, they're indigenous in some way, um, but only, I think it's like 20, I can't remember, 29%. Of that region identifies as indigenous so that means they belong to a formalized indigenous community um, and the reason why they don't look like they overlap in that figure is because indigenous communities they're governed in a different way and so they have different rights in order to form different green management mechanisms um, and so they tend to lean towards that where the fishing unions even though indigenous people and formalized indigenous people are in fishing unions um, those fishing unions do not have the same rights. And so that's in some communities creating a lot of conflict, but in other communities, those two groups, even though they overlap are coming together to work together. Um, but in the communities that where it's creating conflict, you actually see, you know, I've talked to folks and they're like, oh, well, I'm part of this indigenous community and I'm part of a fishing union, but I agree with the indigenous community on this problem. And so then they, they kind of separate out. I have some other figures, um, show their overlap a bit more not in this presentation but it's just doing more general but um they do overlap they're not mutually exclusive i would say the only group that is mutually exclusive uh, are the aquaculture companies like the corporations but the actual people who work for them are not mutually exclusive because a lot of them are children of divers fishing unions or indigenous community leaders they're now working for aquaculture companies in the conversation i had recently with an aquaculture the director of the aquaculture company, um, we were talking about, you know, the, the kind of embeddedness and reliance on these different groups. And that's why we have to work together to like pursue some type of outcome because we can't ignore or push against that corporations like that exist because they are huge play. They are the main players probably in that region. And if we don't recognize that and we you know, my, my friend Jose, who I work with, he's like, it's, it's very complicated. That's what he always says, because he leans towards not wanting to work with them. And then I say, well, I think we need to, you know, because of, and it's just this complicated relationship. Um, so none of the groups are mutually exclusive. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I, I was wondering, Sarah, um, when you get to talk to uh, the, the uh, aquaculture guy again, are you, are you planning on going with a specific ask or are you going to try and parallel something they do or what, what, how are you going to go about that? That's a great question, Kirk. <laughs> I, so I know how I'm going to go about it. I'm not, as many of you know, probably I'm not trained in like getting money <laughs> from groups. Um, I'm trained as an anthropologist. And so one of the things that I struggle with, with this nonprofit, other than applying for grants, which I know I can do is act asking directly for money. <laughs> 
Yeah. And so I have to get up a lot of courage, to be honest, to even talk to that guy. And it's all in Spanish too. And so that like gives me another layer of anxiety if I can't talk business with you know in that context but right. what i what we the, where, where we ended the conversation was he described what they do which is all those programs you know from language revitalization to small-scale aquaculture they work in divers health too but we talked about we don't want to replicate things that already exist and so because that's a big problem with nonprofits nonprofits i mean you can just look at maine all the fisheries organizations in maine they replicate they all replicate what each other do like right yeah. um, i can say that because i work for them so <laughs> um but they, I don't want to replicate what is being done in this region. And so we're doing two things with the aquaculture company. One is co-developing those programs and put kind of like making our programs like the diving accident prevention workshops available, like that framework at least available for them to use because they work mostly with Navy divers and the commercial aquaculture divers yeah, um, and not the rural, not the rural folks that do this type of diving. And so we're, working with them to develop those programs. And then the other piece is a money ask of, of funding things like the other thing I didn't talk about, cause it's not, it's kind of related. To, it's all related to climate change, but is we're developing an internship program for rural youth and they're really interested in that. Um, and so we're, we're doing a direct money ask at yeah. the next thing, but we're meeting with his team. So our team is meeting with his team to talk about like what avenues to take. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's kind of complicated. It, it does, and and it does take it takes practice and persistence and time. You, you'll get better at it as you go. I can yeah. speak from personal experience. My wife's nonprofit; she got better over the years at at maneuvering. Um, mm -hmm. It is a there's a way to do it, and it, it is a learning curve. So I'm sure you'll get there. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting, you know, the critiques I've always heard of nonprofits, especially people who start them, don't have the skills right to actually do a lot of the things that you're supposed to do with a nonprofit. And I definitely fall under that category, but we're doing pretty well overall. And we're applying for, you know, that national, the NIOSH grant, the National Institute of Health, Occupational Health, that's $1.6 million. And so we're going for that and have collaborations with the universities in Chile as well. Um, and so we're looking that our organization is looking to develop more collaborations because there's just things that we'd like to do, especially in the climate change world that, you know, I don't have the skill set, right, to model climate change or resources change or anything like that. And so <clears throat> we're looking for people who are interested in doing that and working with a group. So, Paul, I think you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I got kicked off for a while. My, my internet's not very good where I am right now. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, number one, the um, if I remember correctly, the um, the salmon farming industry in Chile ran into a lot of trouble quite a few years ago, and then they modified their techniques to come closer to what's going on in Norway, uh, where they've been much more successful. So the question is, have you did you see a jump in the way people worked, uh, economics, anything. And the second question is, obviously the uh, seaweed industry in Maine is an emerging industry. Uh, what's And I know you realize that doing the comparison would be very interesting. What sort of things do you think people in Maine could learn from the way they do seaweed farming in Chile? Great question. So the first question, so in, you're, I think you're referring to in 2009, the salmon aquaculture got, a, I can't remember what it's called, but this terrible salmon virus mm -hmm. that spread through the system and it killed everything again, like, like the first time rather. Um, and so they had to clean up their act with that. Um, and so I fall short somewhat in, in understand, I've read a lot about it, but I don't, I haven't, not, I don't, I haven't yet studied the process of uh, aquaculture regulations and changes over time. But from my reading, I understand that after that event with the virus, there were stricter regulations on what fish were eating, how many fish you could keep in a pen, you know, those types of things. Um, but Chile is it's changing now because of new leadership the, in Santiago. But um, Chile is largely a neoliberal state still. And so they, even though there are regulations, they tend to not follow through with regulations on whatever you want to talk about, like mining aquaculture. Um, and so after the 2016 red tide, which was attributed to too many fish in pens, too much 
pollution, you know, dam and feces in the water, basically. Um, there's been this pressure to, again, put on these corporations to clean up. And so talking to the, the man who works there, it sounds like they are cleaning up. And it, and it one of the biggest things that, from what I've understood uh, over the past couple of years that the salmon aquaculture companies are facing is that they're, the people they employ, the divers they employ, um, are having a lot of accidents, a lot of accidents on these, on these aquaculture farms. And um, that's not necessarily attributed to poor regulations. It's, it's more, well, it can be attributed to poor regulations. A lot of divers from, at least anecdotally, are coming you know, high on drugs or they're working too much because you can get contracted by one company and then you're supposed to take a rest, but they'll just go to co be contracted for another company. And so they never get the rest and they have these accidents. And so the aquaculture companies are trying to figure out what to do about these accidents with their employees, um, their contracted employees. I, I can add one more item to think about there, mm -hmm. having spent some time in small aircraft in the Andes. Uh, when you shop around for an aircraft, you have to be very careful. The thing you care most about is what uh, how often they do inspections. Uh, and that's got to be the same with diving equipment. Mm -hmm. particularly in Chile. Yep. Yeah, they need to increase their inspections and they also in need to increase their uh, drug and alcohol testing of their yeah. employees. But, um, and then in terms of a comparison between Chile and Maine with the emergence of seaweed farming, um, seaweed farming is new to me as a researcher and it's mostly coming through the nonprofit of like what communities want. And so, um, what I actually think Maine can learn from Chile, not just only in seaweed farming, but just more broadly, is how to, you know, Maine's contending also with the development of aquaculture. Mainers push back against that, um, and in some part with good reason, but the aquaculture also offers a lot of jobs, and there are ways to do aquaculture that is sustainable in many ways. Um, Chile is not necessarily the perfect example of that, obviously, based on this conversation, but they're trying to be, and what I think is interesting about Chile is how that constellation of actors works together to try to produce something that is sustainable. And those companies, based on my re very recent experience, are very open to working with people, very open to, um, like they, they want to support rural livelihoods and they want to make their money, right? And so how do they support both? And how do they, you know, this, all these, there's 60,000 people that work for them. And so how, how do we create an ecosystem that's functioning? within that group of actors. And I think Maine can start to learn from that um, and how actors in Chile have transitioned their governance because Maine, uh, just many years of working in Maine fisheries, that Maine's fishing focus or fisheries institutions haven't adapted well to the changes that they're seeing and Maine's starting to see a lot of changes. Um, so I think that there's some great comparisons to be drawn in terms of just seaweed. I'm not sure what those comparisons are yet, um, but what I'd love to do someday, this is like a long-term dream of mine, but is to take people who are experts in seaweed farming, whether it's in Maine or in Chile and create some type of exchange. Like how do we, and that's one way to be more inclusive of marginalized groups and rural livelihoods, because a lot of times, you know, people who are doing aquaculture, like someday my husband and I would like to have an aquaculture farm, but we're set up to do that. We can do that. It's the rural people and in the marginalized groups that don't necessarily have access to that type of those types of resources. And so, how do we create those types of resources? How do we create those types of exchanges um, across space, like geographic space um, and cultures? And so, that's something I'd like to do long term. I don't know how how to answer your question though specifically about seaweed at this point. Well, uh, yeah, uh, we're basically out of time. But let me just say the reason I suggest the seaweed is because uh, obviously uh, aquaculture is requires all sorts of things that uh, normal indigenous activities do not. Uh, and because the Chileans have probably been doing seaweed farming much longer uh, than certainly uh, the more recent Mainers, not the indigenous Mainers, but the more recent Mainers, there, there may be a lot to learn and also in comparison to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I don't want to keep us too much longer unless there's another quick question or perhaps people could contact Sarah on their own. But Thank you very much. It was great to Thanks hear your for presentation. Me. Thank you. Good job. Hey, Turk. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Yep. Good. Bye, Simone. Bye, Dominic. Thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs>